You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. We say, well, it hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened yet. It's going to. We're living in the last days, okay? If you haven't figured that out, we are in the last days. Israel's in the nation. They are. There's a bunch of guys who want to kill them who have moved into Syria, and they just happen to be some of the same nations that Ezekiel talks about in chapter 38. Is that a little interesting? Yeah, just a bit. Right now, in major capitals of the world... People often like to pick and choose what scripture they want to read rather than giving equal attention to every book. Trust me, I get it. Some of the books are tougher to understand than others. You may think that Revelation is one not to worry about because surely it won't happen in your lifetime. Well, I'd encourage you to think again and consider the way that current events are lining up with prophecy. In today's message, Pastor Ken explores the unsettling truth that the rapture is likely closer than you may think. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Revelation chapter 6 as he continues his message, Whole Lot of Shaking Going On. I tend to think we're seeing some signs of spiritual warfare here showing up in the text, and John's trying to explain it to us. And Dr. Walvoord, who wrote about this couple of decades ago, he also takes this literally as well. This is not a final breakup of the world. This is a period of judgments being poured on the world ahead of time. It does seem to indicate the beginning with the sixth seal, God's undertaking a direct intervention in human affairs. So they're starting to see who God really is. By the end of the sixth seal, we'll find that there is no atheists left on planet earth. The judgments of war, famine, death, and martyrdom of the saints have originated in human decisions, but now we see God inflicting divine punishment. And what we hear from God after all of this is, do I have your attention now? Are you listening? One more thing. The mountains and the islands moved out of their place. Can that happen with rapidity? Really? Can it happen? I'm going to show you a picture of an island that on January 1st didn't exist. But on March, it did. It's a three-month-old island. It didn't exist in January. But by March, even had a lagoon. By the way, when you start researching this, since 1900, 25 new islands have formed just since 1900 that we know of. And do islands go away? Think Krakatoa. Krakatoa disappeared in an explosion in less than two minutes. It hurled 11 cubic miles of material into the atmosphere, and skies were darkened for 275 miles. Oh, yeah, okay, now all of a sudden I'm seeing sun dark, moon like blood, because of all this stuff there. Dawn did not return in that area for three days. They didn't see the sun for three days. Ash fell 3,700 miles away, 3,800 miles away, thereabouts. And barometers in London, England recorded the explosion. In fact, it went around the world several times. And 13 days later, a layer of sulfide dioxide and gases filtered the sunlight in the earth, and there were interesting sunrises and sunsets for several years, and the average global temperature dropped one and a half degrees. Talk about global cooling. And that's just one volcano. So we talked about the first event that occurs, the seal with the earthquakes. Volcanoes will be happening as a result of it too. And then you see the other things that are being referenced. Yeah, it could be a, a solar and lunar eclipse but it could also be all the debris in the sky and all the gases in the sky as a result of the earthquakes and the volcanoes and the tsunamis and everything else. And here's the deal. This is just a warm-up, okay? Because we see with this seal also, before it all happens, we've got to protect 144,000 
folks to make sure that they can preach the gospel everywhere. But what's the impact of all these events on earth dwellers? Remember, that's a term that shows up over and over and over again in the scriptures, earth dwellers. Verse 15, the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of their wrath has come. And who is able to stand? We now know what it takes to end atheism on planet Earth. It takes some earthquakes and some... Anyway, they all recognize that somebody else is in control. The 144,000 start their ministry shortly after. And there are going to be a lot of people saved just as a result of these events if they're still alive. I mean, there is a piece of rock hanging off of a volcano in the Canary Islands that they said if it ever fell off, it would cause a 400-foot-tall tsunami all along the east coast of the United States. That's real encouraging. Well, it probably will fall at some point here in the future when everything starts shaking. But again, so much for atheism. And I get a kick out of it that says they're going to hide themselves in caves in the mountains. I'm going, well, I guess not all of them get flat, and there are a few that still are around. But you got to go inland, I guess. I don't know. Now, is it possible that the opening in the sky, and this is Tom Constable, who's a teacher at Dallas Seminary, he says, is it possible that the opening in the sky, the rolling back, the scroll, gives earth dwellers a glimpse into the throne room of heaven, and they see these guys being thrown out, and they see the throne of God? Could be. Don't know. I mean, stop and think about it. They're on earth, the sky suddenly has a wormhole show up in it, and you see a throne, and you see things falling out of it. Who knows? But the earth dwellers, the leadership initially, finally all earth dwellers, the same, by the way, as those who hid from Joshua. We've seen this before. It's in the book of Joshua, by the way. They've seen what they're up against through the wormhole, the dimensional portal in the sky, and they go, we don't want any part of it. We're going to go hide in a cave. And we go, that's kind of crazy. Who would hide in a cave? Okay, book of Joshua. His name in Hebrew is Yeshua, the same as Jesus' name. Recall that Joshua is a type of Jesus Christ. And the book is all about the business of kicking out the usurper from the land. Jesus is kicking the usurper off the planet. Joshua is just trying to get him out of Israel. It's an exact picture of Jesus in the book of Revelation. Now, Joshua has just seen Yahweh show up like never before, okay? He actually, in Joshua 10, says, sun stand still. He believed the Lord, that the Lord would do that, and for 36 hours the sun didn't move. So he could continue with battle and combat operations in the light. Much to the chagrin of all of those who he was fighting. So this just happened here in chapter 10. We're going to pick up after this. If you want more on it, see the study on Joshua 10. But verse 12, Joshua spoke to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the son of Israel. And he said in the sight of Israel, this is what stopped it. O sun, stand still at Gibeon. He had that kind of faith. He was that close to the Lord. And he just said, sun, stand still. So it did. Anybody here got that kind of faith? I can't even get a car to stand still, much less the sun. I'd like time to stand still for a while. But he says, O sun, stand still at Gibeon, and O moon in the valley of Ajalon. So the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, until the nation avenged themselves on their enemies. Is it not written in the book of Yashur? And the sun stopped in the middle of the sky and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. It's interesting to note that in China they have some stories about a long night. Interesting stuff. But that's an apocalyptic sign of judgment from Yahweh being delivered to the land dwellers by the forces of Yahweh represented by Joshua. Now, here's the interesting part. This is the reaction, starting in verse 16, of the leadership. These five kings fled and hid themselves in the caves at Makedah. 
And it was told Joshua, saying, The five kings have found hidden in the caves at Makedah. So Joshua said, Roll large stones against the mouth of the cave and assign men to guard them. You don't like hiding in the caves? They're going to stay in the caves. But do not stay there yourselves. Pursue your enemies and attack them in the rear. Do not allow them to enter the cities, for the Lord your God has delivered them into your hand. And it came about when Joshua and the sons of Israel had finished slaying them with a very great slaughter until they were destroyed. And the survivors who remained of them entered the fortified cities, that all the people returned to the camp to Joshua at Makeda in peace. No one uttered a word against any of the sons of Israel. Then Joshua said, open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings to me from the cave. And they did so and brought the five kings out to him from the cave. The king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Yarmouth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. And they brought these kings out to Joshua. And Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said to the chiefs of the men of Israel who had gone with him, come near and put your feet on the necks of these kings. That's how they would humble the enemy in those days. They came near and put their feet on their necks. And Joshua said to them, Do not fear or be dismayed. Be strong and courageous, for thus the Lord will do to all your enemies whom you fight. So afterwards Joshua struck them and put them to death and hanged them on five trees. And they hung on the trees until evening. And it came about at sunset that Joshua gave a command, and they took them down from the trees and threw them into the cave where they had hidden themselves. And they put large stones over the mouth of the cave to this very day. This is a picture in the book of Joshua, of what Jesus is going to do in the book of Revelation. And we see here in chapter 6, everybody hides in the caves. Everybody wants to get away from God's face. It's a picture of Revelation 6, 15 and 16 is what it is. It also shows up elsewhere in the scriptures. Jesus said the women of Jerusalem would act in the same manner. They'd go hide in caves as Rome moved in and destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. He said that in Luke chapter 23, verses 27 to 31. In Isaiah chapter 2, verses 19 to 22, men will go into caves of the rocks, into the holes of the ground, before the terror of the Lord and the splendor of His majesty, when He arises to make the earth tremble. We're talking about the day of the Lord. Same thing. Consistency all through the Scriptures. In that day, men will cast away to the moles and the bats their idols of silver and their idols of gold which they made for themselves to worship in order to go into the caverns of the rocks and the clefts of the cliff before the terror of the Lord and the splendor of His majesty when He arises to make the earth tremble. Stop regarding man whose breath of life is in his nostrils. Why should he be esteemed? So the reaction of every category of humanity here in chapter 6 is hide us. When they go and try and hide themselves. What happened in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve sinned? When they saw or heard God walking? They hid. Well, what's happening here? You look up through this opening in the heavens and, oh my goodness, that's the throne room. And he's throwing things out of it that look like falling stars. I'm reminded of what it says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Well, the earth dwellers are about to figure that out. So this is the day of the Lord. This is the beginning of the tribulation. Daniel's 70th week is at hand. It is the great day of wrath. It's about to start. Daniel 12, 1, at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise. There'll be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who's found written in the book, will be rescued. Jeremiah talked about it as well in chapter 30, verse 7. Alas, for the day is great, there is none like it. It is the time of Jacob's distress, but he, Jacob, will be saved from it. And Jesus talked about it in Matthew 24, 21. For then will be great tribulation such as not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. More in Isaiah. And again, we're in the Old Testament. This is where this all shows up initially. Verse 8, they will be terrified. Pains and anguish will take hold of them. They'll writhe like a woman in labor. They'll look at one another in astonishment. Their faces aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger to make the land a desolation. And he'll exterminate its sinners from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. 
Thus I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. I will make mortal man scarcer than pure gold and mankind than the gold of Ophar. I mean, remember, we've already talked about the second seal, which was war. And then we saw in the fourth seal, a fourth of the planet has been destroyed, 1.4 billion. There's still quite a few left. There's like four and a half billion still left at this point. But we don't know how many are going to die as a result of the tsunamis and the earthquakes and all of that. The scripture doesn't tell us. But we do consider the fact that it's going to be a lot of people killed. And it says, and the earth will be shaken from its place at the fury of the Lord of hosts in the day of his burning anger. And again, Isaiah 34, 4, all the host of heaven will wear away. The sky will be rolled up like a scroll. All their hosts will also wither away as the leaf withers from the vine and as one withers from a fig tree. And Nahum, another minor prophet in chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, says, who can stand before his indignation. Who can endure the burning of his anger? His wrath is poured out like fire and the rocks are broken up by him. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble and he knows those who take refuge in him. But with an overflowing flood he'll make a complete end of its sight and will pursue his enemies into darkness. What we're seeing here in Revelation is, and the tribulation hasn't kicked off yet. This, it's getting ready to with the sixth seal. What sinners dread most is not death but the revealed presence of God, who they've just probably seen through this hole in the heavens, this dimensional portal when everything starts happening from a supernatural perspective. There is deep psychological truth in the remarks of Genesis 3.8. I like that comment of Dr. Sweat, or Sweet, however you pronounce his name. Genesis 3.8 says they heard this, and again, this is Adam and Eve, and this is what happens when men first Send. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. They've already had a problem with fruit, okay? In the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. That's the first time that man hides themselves from God. And in Revelation, we see that it's still happening. People do not want to encounter the living God. Why is it? Why don't they want to do that? They know there's something wrong. They know that the communication has been broken. And there's only one way to solve it. Paul talks about it in 2 Corinthians. He says, at the acceptable time I listened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you, behold, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. He also says in Romans 10, Verse 8, what does it say? The words near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we're preaching. <laughs> this, is what all, this is only what people have to do. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. That's it. That's all that it says. It doesn't say anywhere in there, in the words, that you have to go and do anything, say anything, uh, go through a certain number of beads on a certain prayer method. You don't have to go and do certain things or certain acts. It just says simply, confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You'll be saved. That's it. That's it. After that, then everything starts changing dramatically. With the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. 2 Peter 3, 9-12, and this is the thing that we have to remember as we're looking at this section of Scripture we say, well, it hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened yet. It's going to. We're living in the last days, okay? If you haven't figured that out, we are in the last days. Israel's in the nation. They are. There's a bunch of guys who want to kill them who have moved into Syria, and they just happen to be some of the same nations that Ezekiel talks about in chapter 38. Is that a little interesting? Yeah, just a bit. Right now, in major capitals of the world, geopolitically speaking, there are plans being made to figure out what to do about Jerusalem. It's become a stone that everybody's tripping over, as the Bible says. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 to 12, Peter says this, The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That's why 
with chapter 6, verse 17, they want the earth to fall, but before all this happens, there's going to be 144,000 evangelists sent out after all this happens to win more people to the Lord. That's why it hasn't happened yet. If the tribulation had started before I was saved, I wouldn't be here. But the Lord was not slow about His promise. He's patient. He's not wishing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. We won't know it when it happens. When Jesus comes and takes His church, there's not going to be an announcement. Tomorrow I'm coming to take you. There's a group of folks who thought that would be the case in 1848, I think it was. They all sold everything, went to a mountain, and that day came and went. Then the guy refigured, and he said, oh, no, I missed it by a year and a half. So he went back a year and a half later and still didn't get it right. People keep trying to predict. We can't. The day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? He says we can hasten the coming of the day of God. How do we do that? Well, there's a certain number of people who are going to be saved until the days of the Gentiles are filled. Once that last person is saved, he calls us and we're out of here. That makes Satan a little paranoid every time somebody's saved. Is that the one? Don't know. The same voice that says, come unto me, and he says that today, if that invite is refused, will later say to that same person who refused, depart from me, you cursed. Definitely today is the day of salvation. But if we turn away from that salvation, all we got left to look at is judgment. That's it. There's nothing else. So, yeah, it's a dark picture so far in chapter 6, but before it all starts, we're going to set aside 144,000 evangelists. And there's one tribe that's not mentioned in that list. Dan. And I'll give you a hint so you can start looking at it. The tribes are listed in a specific order that's not the birth order. It's been flipped around because each tribe name means something and it tells a story. So we'll talk about that too. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for what you're telling us in your word that as we come closer and closer to when you call us home, that there is judgment that's going to be falling on this planet for those who have rejected you and those who don't want anything to do with you. Lord, help us to be about your business. This is in Peter to see about hastening the day of the Lord by seeing how many more that we can reach for you, how many more we can talk to and tell our story about what you've done for us and then just rely on you to change their lives. Help us to live in the light of the fact that you're coming very soon and that the days are coming to an end. And even though there are people who say, oh, it'll never change, it's always going to be the same, your word says, no, at a point in time, that's it, it's over with. Lord, help us to live in light of that and help us to be ready for you and to live a life that's consistently looking for you and then doing what it is that you've called us to do while we're waiting. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for the time in it. Again, we just claim the promise of blessing that you promised as we study the book of Revelation. Just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's message was in the book of Revelation. Pastor Ken has been teaching from this prophetic book here on the Unsafe Bible. You hear often about people trying to predict the end of the world or referring to some kind of apocalyptic event. But the truth is, the real apocalypse or revelation of Jesus Christ is something unlike anything else. If you know Jesus, you see these events as something that God will bring about to eventually restore things to how they were meant to be. If you view God as an enemy, you would naturally perceive the events in Revelation as some foreign enemy seeking to wreak havoc on the world and bring it to ruin. So what's the truth? If you're curious about what we believe and what our core foundation is built on, 
go to theunsafebible.com to learn more. Are you in the Jupiter, Florida area? If so, you're welcome to join us for these types of teachings in person. You'll find ways to contact us on our website so you can learn when and where we meet each week. You can also access more teachings online by going to theunsafebible.com and looking under the media tab. Catch up on any messages you've missed or listen to one you already heard as a refresher. Once again, that's theunsafebible.com. We're so glad you took the time today to hear from God and His Word. Pastor Ken has more to share from the book of Revelation, so don't miss a single edition. In the meantime, continue growing on your own in this very peculiar book of the Bible. And join us again on The Unsafe Bible.